right, so thank you everybody for being here. I really uh, appreciate everybody taking time out of their, their hot Saturday afternoon uh, for a very, very special presentation which we've prepared here. Uh, Christine Corey, Dave Gosselin, myself have three presentations uh, tackling a subject that a lot of people um, think that they're somewhat familiar with, but we're going, what we're going to go through I think will pleasantly surprise everyone here and watching at home uh, about the real nature and mission of Edgar Allan Poe and the importance of rediscovering Poe as an individual, as a creative thinker, and as a universal uh, historical personality in today's world. The, the purpose of really get, digging into the figure of Edgar Allan Poe, and this is going to be, this is a part of a series of presentations uh, that we've been building on. Um, this is going to continue throughout the summer and into the autumn. Um, the purpose of really looking at Poe is not just that we're going to learn more about ourselves by really digging into his writings in a serious way. We're also going to learn about the nature of mind, about human nature, about our passions, our impulses, um, our motives for forming an identity and forming goals for ourselves. And we're going to learn a little bit about universal history, which is the purpose of the presentation I'm going to get, give as the first of the three presentations for today. Um, now, I'll just ask people here, um, what do people usually think, I, mean, I think we're all pretty well familiar with the real Edgar Poe, but what do people encounter in the population when, when you meet people who, who are fans of literature and they think of Poe, what do they tend to think of? Spooky, horror, Halloween. Like an emo idol. Emo idol? Like a, idol. an existentialist, yeah. Goth, death fixated, Morbidity. a morbid, alcoholic, opium smoking fiend who just writes these characters in his stories who are killers, a just a, a druggy artist, yeah, who's just externalizing his own internal perversions when he's writing about these characters, doing these terrible things in a lot of his horror stories. Um, not only is this not true, as all of the the friends and allies of Poe uh, in the years after he died attested that not only is this not true, uh, but the key figure who is responsible for shaping uh, this terrible slanderous myth is a fellow by the name of Rufus Griswold, that's a, an image of him, who was a, an enemy of Poe during the course of Poe's life. He was a, an editor, a wannabe poet himself, who was caught uh, plagiarizing throughout the entirety of his career, which spanned, I mean, he was born in 1815, died in, in the 1850s. Um, he is directly responsible, and, and even many Poe scholars admit that he is responsible for a lot of these slanders, and that he even uh, was, there's reliable evidence that he even plagiarized, or counterfeited uh, several letters by, in Poe's hand, uh, attributing uh, false words to Poe himself, which still confuses people to this day. But even though people had, are aware that he uh, was a liar, they still continue to perpetrate the belief in Poe as a degenerate that he started. Um, the interesting thing about Griswold isn't just that he's the enemy of Poe. Yeah, Juan Carlos is outside. Is, but that also he uh, claimed to be the literary executor uh, in control of all of Poe's papers, so that the moment Poe died in 1849, he immediately uh, went to Poe's impoverished aunt and offered her a certain amount of money to have access to all of Poe's works, which he then controlled and published along with being his official biographer. Um, now, <clears throat> Griswold himself wanted to be, in his own words, the permanent underlying... Uh, he wanted to write of an anthology of, of American literature that was going to become the permanent underlying literature of our age and nation, uh, meaning he wanted to redefine the identity of what America was forever in his epic work, uh, which Poe completely annihilated in 1843. This is how they became enemies. And Poe gave a series of lectures called the... Uh, poets and prose of, of, of America uh, in order to destroy the lies that Griswold had spread about the nature of poetry and what should proper poetry be in America. Um, so how is it that Poe gave authorization for a guy like this to become the literary agent and, and controller of all of his works? 
which is what the, that's the story as it goes. Um, we're we're going to find out by looking at the obituary that Griswold wrote under a pseudonym uh, a day after Poe had died in, in 1849 that this could not be true, that there's no way that Poe could have given authorization because what Griswold himself said about uh, Poe in the obituary that was spread all over uh, the United States reads, Edgar Poe is dead. He died in Baltimore the day before yesterday. This announcement will start, startle many, but few will be grieved at it. There seemed to him no moral susceptibility, and what was more remarkable in a proud nature, little or nothing of the true point of honor. He had, to a morbid excess, that desire to rise, which is vulgarly called ambition, but no wish for the esteem or the love of his species, only the hard wish to succeed, not shine, not serve, but to succeed, that he might have the right to despise a world which galled his self-conceit. Now, does that really seem like somebody who uh, Poe would have given complete authorization to uh, <laughs> control all of his works, many of which were uh, mysteriously lost uh, by Griswold after this happened? And the next question is, why would this lie be maintained over generations? I mean, isn't Poe just a, a writer of fiction? Why would, why would there be such an effort to destroy, to, to destroy the character, to assassinate the character of, of somebody like Poe and have it maintained? And is, does this even come close to describing who Poe is? Well, let's look at Poe's own words. Uh, one of his first jobs, he, uh, he basically made it very clear what side of the fence he stood in the battle for creativity in the world uh, when he said, when shall the artist assume his proper station in society? How long shall the various vermin of the earth who crawl around the altar of Maman, Maman is the god of money, uh, how long shall the various vermin of the earth who crawl around the altar of Maman be more esteemed of men than they, the gifted ministers to those exalted emotions which link us to the mysteries of heaven? To our own query, we may venture a reply, not long. A spirit is already abroad at war with it. So Poe is, in the course of this very short uh, statement, he's really laying out that you already have a battle between two different factions of creativity, two different impulses or motives of the creative impulse. On the one hand, you have uh, artists who are inspired purely by money and in, a po in opposition to that, you have real artists who strive to link mankind to the divine, to something higher that makes us more ennobled, more sublime, and better citizens of the world. Um, <clears throat> the next question we're going to look is, at, at is, okay, well, what, what is going on in the world such that Poe enters the scene at a certain point in world history and chooses to identify with a certain aspect, a, a certain side of the fight that we've seen Obviously, he is not for the, uh, the artists who are worshippers of Mammon. He's not for Griswold and, and the people that Griswold works for, um, who Poe identifies very early on as being a source of corruption of the minds and morals of America and something which is causing America to self-destruct. Um, so what is the world that he's entering? And to do that first, we have to look at well, who is Poe a little bit more in depth, okay? Because Poe died. I, I mentioned very quickly he died. Um, at an early age, he was barely 40, um, and obviously Griswold took the control of the narrative of who he was. Uh, the, already, the, the, the circumstances surrounding his death are very weird by themselves. You know, he's on, the, he's on his way from um, Virginia to New York, where he has a, a very important plan, uh, which I'm going to say at the very end. And on his trip, he has to pass through Baltimore on train. And that's the last time he's seen. He's di he disappears for five days. Nobody knows what happens uh, to him in that period. Until one day, he's found completely drugged up in a swoon, um, lying half unconscious on a, on a dark street, wearing somebody else's clothing. And he's brought to a hospital, where for the rest of his duration in, in that hospital, he's not allowed to speak to anybody. Nobody is allowed to speak to him. He's sealed off in a, in a room with bars and he dies. So already that's very strange. Um, and there's an entire infrastructure put into place 
around Griswold to control, like I said, the entire character, the, the definition of what he is immediately upon his death, before his body is even cold. Uh, Poe was born. Okay, so who is Poe? He was, he was born in 1809. His two parents had died at a very early age. He wasn't even two years old. His mother and father, who were Shakespearean actors, uh, both died. Um, his grandfather is the leading quartermaster general of the American Revolution, um, who worked closely with George Washington and, Al and Lafayette, the Marquis of France. Um, he is adopted by an individual who's a wealthy businessman named uh, David no, sorry, John, um, John Allen, which is where he gets his middle name. And he's sent with his family, his new family, to Britain, where he studies in, in grammar school uh, before returning back to the United States. And it's upon returning back to the United States in 1824, 1824 that something very interesting happens to him. Um, he's immediately brought into uh, contact with one Marquis Lafayette, who was in the middle of doing a grand tour for many months in the course of 1824 around America. Uh, he's there for two purposes. Um, I'm going to say what those are in a second. But Poe, under the, the guidance of um, Sir Winfield Scott, who goes on later on to become a, a leading figure around Abraham Lincoln, but Sir Winfield Scott ensures that Poe is made an honorary... Um, what's called a uh, youth honor guard in Richmond, Virginia, accompanying Lafayette during his entire tour of, of Richmond. Lafayette goes to visit David Poe, uh, his, Poe's grandfather's house, thinking that his grandfather was still alive. They were very close, uh, close friends, and he discovers that he's dead, but he befriends young Poe, and Poe accompanies him everywhere for uh, a, a long period of time during his visit. This completely transforms the character and the orientation of Poe's entire life. Lafayette is, like I said, I would say why he was there. He was in, in America for two reasons. One was to ensure the victory, the presidential victory of John Quincy Adams. And at the time, that was very important. So it was, it was very much understood that the principles of the American Revolution, this is the second, third generation after the revolution in 1776, uh, the principles were being lost. America was getting corrupted mentally, emotionally, morally, uh, you had a loss of the character of the people and a, for, a forgetfulness of what actually gave birth to the, the revolution in the first place. Um, it was recognized that John Quincy Adams was the only potential leader who could actually fill the vacuum and save America at that time in the 1820s. There was nobody else except those who were recognized as being uh, operatives and agents of Wall Street and, and the city of London. So Marquis Lafayette rallies support for John Quincy Adams, who ends up winning the elections by one vote. So that was vital. Number two, he's, he was organizing for an international revolution of Republican movements across Europe. This is very vital. He was organizing a lot of support. While he was in America, he met with uh, leaders of the Canadian rebellions. Uh, William Lyon Mackenzie uh, King met with Lafayette, uh, for a period in, uh, in, in not Baltimore, in uh, Buffalo. And he was organizing for all, all sorts of support because it wasn't just in France that there was a potential for a reenactment, a proper reenactment of the American Revolution, uh, which failed a few years before. I'm going to go through that. But also across Germany, Spain, uh, Poland was the biggest, uh, the biggest likelihood of, of it being a success. And, uh, and he was recruiting a lot of people to this. So after he uh, meets with Lafayette, he soon finds himself in West Point, the elite military academy set up by allies of Washington and Lafayette um, a little while after the Revolution. And it was set up by the people who were essentially what's called the Society of Cincinnati. It was an organization set up that Lafayette ran in France. Hamilton was the president in America. And the purpose of this was to create an organization that could uh, maintain the continuity of those principles of America. And your main count for eligibility was you had to be a son or a grandchild of an officer of the war. Um, Poe definitely was eligible for this. Uh, his grandfather was a direct member. But, so Poe finds himself in West Point. Uh, again, he's brought there by Winfield Scott and another uh, Society of Cincinnati member named General Thayer, who's the head of the academy. And he spends uh, some number of months there. And official Poe historians then basically all say that he washed out. He couldn't handle it. He was a weak student. He basically was kicked out. 
Um, is that true? Well, according to Poe's own hand, if you actually want to take his own writings uh, seriously, no, there's other evidence to, to show the contrary. Not only are his academic records impeccable, he is one of the best students, um, but he writes a letter, because he doesn't finish uh, at West Point, even though he is a, a great uh, student, he writes a letter to the head of the academy, Thayer, in, in 1830, where he says, Dear Sir, having no longer any ties which can bind me to my native country, I intend by the first opportunity to proceed to Paris with the view of obtaining, through the interest of the Marquis de Lafayette, an appointment, if possible, in the Polish army. In the event of the interference of France in behalf of Poland, this may be easily effected. At all events, it will be my only feasible plan for procedure. The object of this letter is respectfully to request that you will give me such assistance as may lie in your power in the furtherance of my views. A certificate of standing in my class is all that I have any right to expect. Anything further, a letter to a friend in Paris or to the Marquis, would be a kindness which I would never forget. So at this point, the post scholars tend to say, well, you know, that was just an anomaly. He didn't actually follow through with any of those plans. He didn't go to Europe. He basically just became a degenerate writer and started gambling and uh, trying to make a buck publishing where he could uh, and stayed in America, never left America. Uh, we're going to see that there's a lot of evidence that that is not true for the reasons that we already established at the beginning of this class. Um, so again, let's review. What is, what is Lafayette actually doing in history? Because Lafayette is, is a key figure shaping this period of a lot of potential in world history at this time. What is he doing? Uh, what, are the, what is the dynamic being shaped by? Uh, Lafayette is a Republican in a monarchical system, right? Europe, as well as um, up until 1774, you didn't have anything called a republic or a, a democratic republic or anything like that. You had different types of systems of empire based on the law of the divine right of kings, right? If you're born to a special family with hereditary powers, then that's enough for you to have authorization to rule your slaves. If you're born into a slave family who's poor, well, you're right and you're, you know, what's right for you is to basically behave, be a good little feudal serf, and don't make waves. That was the law. Uh, the Republican movement that arose with uh, the American Revolution completely rejected that. And this is where you had the idea for the first time that there are inalienable rights in every individual, regardless of what family you're born from, and the type of laws, the, the definition of government, the, the definition of human nature, the definition of creativity, the beauty, goodness, all of this will be the same words might be used by a monarchist as would be used by a Republican, but the meaning of them, the power that they give to the people who wield them would be totally different. And that's really vital to keep in mind. And it was understood that the, the British system, in spite of good British people, was part of the monarchical order. It was one of the, the dominant uh, power structures in the world. Lafayette was entering into a world to try to overthrow that. But he, as we're going to see, um, didn't figure certain things out. But he was the organizing force at this time. So which side was Poe on? Well, in 1846, uh, Poe directly says in Graham's Magazine, um, we know the British to bear us little but ill will. We know that in no case do they utter unbiased opinions of American books. We know that in the few instances in which our writers, American writers, have been treated with common decency in England, these writers have either openly paid homage to English institutions or have had lurking at the bottom of their hearts a secret principle at war with democracy. We know all this, and yet, day after day, submit our necks to the degrading yoke of the crudest opinion that emanates from the, from the fatherland. Now, if we must have nationality, let it be a nationality that will throw off this yoke. So again, it's a young America. It's not even 100 years old yet. And he's making a point that if we're going to define what the nation is going to be, let's make it a rejection of those uh, principles of empire. And if you look at all of the people that Poe is known to have made a lot of enemies uh, in the literary world in his day, if you look at all of them, from the transcendentalists, uh, the Knickerbocker clique, uh, all of them, and you look at where they're funded from, who's publishing them, all of these people who Poe is calling out as being uh, frauds or uh, imposters, corruptors of the minds of the youth, are all under the payroll of British intelligence. And that's provable. 
It's not just somebody saying it as a conspiracy theory. That's provable. Um, the same figures you'll find who are American families who are making their fortunes off the opium wars against China are also backing these things up in New England. So again, let's just look at Lafayette here briefly. Uh, so let's take a little sweep of universal history, okay? There's, there's four main points that I just want to brush on very quickly as an introduction to something that's not taught in schools in a proper way. These are taught often as, as just dates that happen that we have to memorize to pass a test. There's so much more to it. Uh, the role of Lafayette starts in world history when he's a young man, 19. He ends up coming to, from France, from a noble family. He has all the comforts that a, that a young man could want. And he chooses to, in spite of all of that, go to, to America and risk his life along with hundreds of other uh, nobility who had inside of them a, a certain passion for what humanity could become. Largely, a lot of this was organized by Benjamin Franklin for which is important to keep in mind in the back of our heads, because Franklin was also the American representative to France for well over a decade and did a lot of work to organize an entire network in Europe to support the American cause. Uh, Lafayette was one of these young, young prodigies. So he came to America. Um, there's a period after the American Revolution is a success, and there's a period of potential, of hope, where this will now be replicated across Europe. And in 1789, it begins in, in France. Uh, Lafayette is at the center of that. That doesn't really go as planned, as we'll see. Uh, and in, instead, after uh, many, many years, you have the Congress of Vienna, which is another key moment in world history uh, in 1815. And then in 1830, which is the period that Poe enters the scene into this, this stage, um, there's a, another chance, another great opportunity. So just to quickly uh, focus in a little bit more, so as I said, he was 19. This is a statue of him in Morristown, New Jersey, with Hamilton, Washington, and Lafayette is on the left um, in 1880, where he's giving the news, the happy news, that France will come in more openly supporting the American cause. This completely shifts the tides for America, who were, the Americans were, in all likelihood, going to lose the revolution at that period, had France not come in under the guidance of Lafayette. Uh, below what we have is the Battle at Very Valley Forge. It was one of the harshest winters in America uh, during the American Revolution in 1777, where hundreds of, of American servicemen died of dysentery, of, of starvation. Uh, shoes were not something everybody had access to. Uh, a lot of people had lost their feet to the cold, one of the coldest winters. And Lafayette came uh, to America in that, in that very, very despairing, demoralizing process. Um, and he stuck it out. He, he fought with the soldiers. He, he wasn't just a general sitting in, the, in some back tent in safety, but he was living with them in the tents and the front lines. And he earned a lot of respect as a young man, uh, as being more than just a, 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 you know, a titled, uh, fluffy noble kid. And it was that period, uh, a few months before the Valley of Forge, where he uh, fought one of the most bloody battles called the Battle of Brandywine where the headquarters in Richmond, Virginia, was David Poe's house. So Lafayette and the quartermaster general, David Poe, the grandfather of Poe, uh, worked very closely together. And that was, like I said, the headquarters. Um, <clears throat> so by 1783, like I said, it's finalized. America now sets up as the first democratic republic in world history. And within a few years, there's, like I said, a chance for this to be replicated in France. And if it's done well in France, the, there was already something very, very big in place in Prussia, Germany, Spain, Poland, at that time, to uh, replicate it across Europe. And keep in mind, America, the American Revolution, what we should keep in mind is that this was not an American experience. It could only have happened because you had an international network of humanists who were all coming from, from different parts of the world, including... Uh, Muslims in Morocco and India who worked very closely to keep the British um, fighting in India in, in certain re rebellions. Um, this was done consciously by Indian leaders at that time who were very aware of Washington and what he was doing in the Americas. And that also caused a, a big shift in the tides towards the American cause. But it was an international affair. So it was recognized that it wasn't just a national issue. What you have here are two pictures. On the right, you have the Oath of Lafayette at the Fête de la Fédération, the 14th of July, 1790. Um, and at the bottom, that's him kissing the hand of Marie Antoinette. Now, 
Antoinette and, and Louis XVI were not terrible people. They were in generally, in, for monarchists, they were uh, in favor of the American Revolution. They did a lot to even help bring weapons to the United States. They weren't bad people, but the times would not allow for the thing that Marquis Lafayette wanted, which was a coexistence of monarchical principles of the, of the divine rights of kings with republican institutions of everybody created with inalienable rights. That's what he ended up uh, choosing to do with his uh, pledge to Antoinette to, <laughs> to maintain both. And, and the, the population in Paris were all calling for him to become the president. He had every opportunity to declare himself president and make it a real republic, but he chose to not break with his cultural predilections towards the nobility and tried to compromise. And by doing that, it was a mess. And uh, in consequence, you had the, <laughs> the lack of, of resolution caused a complete bloodbath for many years. You had um, the British, British Foreign Office and the British Museum have on their records pay stubs directly uh, sent, that were sent to people like Robespierre, Danton, Marat, uh, leaders of the French Revolution, who rallied the mob basically to become an unthinking, emotional uh, battering ram for the oligarchy to destroy all structures of, of control. And one of the mottos of the, of the revolution was, la révolution n'a pas besoin des scientifiques. So the revolution doesn't need scientists. They cut off the heads of a lot of the key people that Marquis Lafayette and Franklin were working with. Um, everything was, was deemed to be elitist, and everything elitist had to be destroyed. And of course, what came out of that after several years was no leadership. There was nothing left. And Marquis Lafayette saved his skin by, by retreating to Austria, where he became a prisoner in, a, in an Austrian dungeon for five years. Um, Napoleon cleaned up. He filled the vacuum. And you had 20 years of chaos reigning around Europe at that time. When Napoleon was put down in 1815, after the Battle of, Battle of Waterloo, I won't talk about his, his attempted resurgence, but you had a, a very nasty conference that was set up over the course of eight to nine, I think it was nine months, known as the Congress of Vienna. And the Congress of Vienna was set up essentially as the restoration of the monarchies. You had 200 noble families who were present for those eight months, leaders, heads of state, everybody were, were reassembled to figure out in a post-Napoleonic world, how do we restore order and cleanse Europe of the ideals that caused us all of these disturbances and problems? How do we get rid of the ideas of liberty and republicanism from Europe? And this is where you have Prince Metternich is there in the middle, who's sort of the leading controller of a lot of this stuff. One of his key assistants is the enemy of Schiller. Um, forgot his name all of a sudden. Yeah. And they're essentially dividing up Europe and, and reestablishing certain controls. One thing that's forgotten, uh, that's overlooked, is that you have two things that come out of this. You have in Paris, a meeting set up within months of this beginning, um, known as the Holy Alliance, which is technically Prussia, Austria, Russia, but it's joined very quickly by England and France. So it's a you know, five-way alliance. But then you have the Carlsbad Decree. So to get a sense of the evil of this thing, the Carlsbad Decrees were that it wasn't enough to just impose political controls. We had to get rid of the ideas. We have to get rid of any artistic sentiments that will awaken something noble that, was, that caused us all of these chaotic problems. And in, in these decrees, you have uh, essentially inquisitors that are, uh, that are legally set up in every university across Europe that have absolute rights to fire any teacher who's caught spreading um, Republican ideas. And once you're fired, if you've gone be before that inquisitor and you're fired, you're not allowed to get another job as a teacher anywhere ever again. If you're a student and you're caught part of these um, Republican secret societies, like the Society of Cincinnati that we looked at, and you're caught, you're not allowed to ever be a student anywhere in Europe, ever. This is why you had a lot of uh, Republicans from Germany and stuff coming to America during this period, because they couldn't get any work anywhere, anywhere else. In the newspapers, you have censors now being set up. To, every newspaper that publishes has to have their newspaper first sent to the censor uh, to have it verified that it's acceptable, and it's not passing off ideas that will disturb the public order. And whole books and authors are, put, are blacklisted. Schiller is not readable by law, effectively. Music inspired by Schiller, poetry inspired by Schiller, is not readable under the Carlsbad decrees. His books are not permitted to be published. But this, this type of suppression, the suffocation of, of the natural inclination for creativity, has a pushback. So you have a boiling over at a certain point. And, and it's in 1830 that we're going to re, 
visit where we, where we left off. So now at this point, Lafayette is back in Europe. And you have the reactivation of what I called here the, the second chance for a French Revolution. Um, it took a lot of years to organize, and it finally happens. And when you start looking at this whole process, you start seeing this very, very fascinating picture of, of American artists and poets as part of the Society of Cincinnati in France at the time. All, of, all are there at the same time between 1828 and 1832. You have so many American artists who are there. Uh, here's just a few of them. And you have Samuel B. Morse, the famous painter and inventor, uh, who painted that, that painting of, of Lafayette when he was in America in 1824, being looked at by Washington and and Franklin. There's a whole story with that, which is interesting. But you have Morse there, just a few houses down from Lafayette, who's next door to uh, James Fenimore Cooper. Everyone here knows who James Fenimore Cooper is? So-so? He's, a very, he's a, a very important American literary figure uh, who wrote books that were basically all reflecting the ideals of what America could be in a fictional way, but he also wrote a lot of nonfiction too. Uh, these were being published and translated all across Europe. Uh, Schubert, actually on his deathbed in 1829, asked for all of uh, Cooper's works, the Leatherstocking Tales, to be brought to him. That's what he wanted to read before he died. Um, Goethe was inspired by Cooper's works to want to uh, live in America, but he just said, I'm a little bit too old. <laughs> but really, I mean, it, this is, they were very, very powerful ideals, and he was understood to be the living representative of what America could be in Europe, because a lot of the Europeans didn't know what exactly are we fighting for. How, how, what are these ideals concretely? Why should I risk my life, my life to overthrow a feudal structure that I, I don't even know is going to replace it? So these poets were very important at kindling the imagination and embodying those principles in a serious way. Uh, Thayer is the head of West Point, who's also the person who uh, Poe wrote to, who was close to Poe, um, who's in France. You have Washington Irving. The, the author of Sleepy Hollow, but many other works, who's the ambassador to Spain, where he's organizing a Spanish revolution in alignment with Lafayette. There's many others I'm not even bringing up right now. Uh, by the way, the, Morse, for, he had certain problems, but he also wrote a very fascinating book called Foreign Conspiracies Against Our Liberties of, in America, uh, a book that goes through Metternich and the entire uh, plot to overthrow American institutions which is it's worth reading. But, so we still don't really quite know, did Poe actually go? We didn't prove that yet. We just, we're just looking at the sort of context, and we're zeroing in on it. And this is where a 1920s discovery comes in very handy, because there's a letter which many Poe experts deny exists because it just troubles them. It, it, it goes against the narrative that they're very comfortable with. Uh, but it was a letter written in... Uh, Dumas' hands, Alexander Dumas, the author of The Three Musketeers, where Dumas is describing his encounter with Poe. Dumas himself is an interesting character, and, and I think just reading this excerpt is useful, uh, where Dumas said, it was about the year 1832. One day, an American presented himself at my house with an introduction from James Fenimore Cooper. Needless to say, I welcomed him with open arms. His name was Edgar Poe. From the outset, I realized that I had to deal with a remarkable man. Two or three remarks which he made upon my furniture, the things I had about me, the way my articles of everyday use were strewn about my room, and on my moral and intellectual characteristics impressed me with their accuracy and truth. Duma, so he's describing here a very interesting encounter. Um, I brought up how Edgar Poe is the, uh, sorry, Lafayette is the head of the Society of Cincinnati and in France. He's the leading architect and, and organizer of this Republican resistance. Uh, Duma, his grandfather, was the highest level, um, he was a brigadier general in the French army, uh, army who was born in Haiti. He was, uh, he was half black, and um, he rose to the highest level of, of stature of any uh, man of color. Uh, up until his time. It was only in the 1960s that that was beaten by somebody who rose to a, a similar stature. Um, he was a leading ally of Lafayette during the French Revolution. And in 
all evidence points to the fact that Dumas was also a part of this network too. He qualified for membership of the Society of Cincinnati. He himself was a member of a, of a certain group that ended up fighting in Italy with Garibaldi where he set up a, a, a Republican printing press and a magazine. And he was even inspired to write a series of murder mysteries inspired by Poe's murders on the, on the Rue Morgue um, in the 1860s. Some of his detractors who say this, this letter is a fraud, they will say in the course of this letter, I didn't read all of it, uh, that he's describing the character of Poe as being too much like Inspector Dupin, who Poe writes about in his, uh, in his writings. You know, a character who's, who's got a penetrating ability to see beyond the surface of things uh, into, the, into the depths of men's minds, who only does his writing and his, his creative work at night and shuts his windows uh, during the day. And people say, oh, no, it's, it's too forced. It, it, it's too much like this character Poe writes about. It must be fake. And one could maybe pay homage to that or respect to that uh, excuse to discount this letter, except for the fact that 1832 was four years before the first Dupin mystery was ever produced. So um, looking at what we know about the general context, it's, I wouldn't be so quick to dismiss this. So what actually happened? We have 1830, we have the revolution having a second chance, we have this whole network in France, and Lafayette fails a second time. He basically goes along with the same agenda that he had, the same plan that he had embarked upon with Marie Antoinette uh, in, in 1789 to try to have a, a constitutional monarchy. Again, it's a complete, the revolution is, is a success. He's now standing on the balcony uh, in front of all of the people of France. Cooper is in the audience with Morse, and they're waiting for him to declare the country finally a republic, at which point it will be, able, it will be very easy to go in and back up the Polish uh, republican movement, which is about to happen. The Polish need that, re that French revolution to succeed for them to succeed. And instead, he basically is induced to cut a deal, and he's given the promise by Philippe Galité, who basically says, I will be a good monarch. I will be your instrument for Republican principles, but in a hereditary power structure. And Lafayette, being an unfortunate personality, a tragic personality, he goes along with it, agrees. And the deal is he will now run the military of France, and Egalité will run the, the political structures um, is a huge disappointment, and this is eight, July 30th, uh, 1830, and everything falls apart. Everything falls apart. Uh, within a few months, of course, uh, Lafayette is ousted from his position as the head of the military. There's no ability now to support the, the Polish cause, and you essentially have a neo-Jacobin uh, movement, which, which predominates. So for the next decades, across Europe, with no leadership once more, you have young Europe movements, young Italy, young Germany, young England, uh, all, young Poland. Uh, the, the November uprising fails in Poland. 6,000 Polish refugees who led the revolution, who didn't die uh, by, after it was crushed by the Russians, they make their way to France, where in Paris they're protected by Marquis Lafayette, but even that's limited. Um, this, so, you know, you have chaos taking over Europe. Um, all of the potential disappears. It's really quite a shame. And if you look at where these young Europe neo-Jacobin movements uh, are, where are they getting controlled by? Who, who's running them? And you'll find that it's the same British money, the same British intelligence operations that ran the first Jacobin movement that funded Robespierre and Danton and Marat through different secret societies back in the 1790s. It's the same operation, the same model is deployed, except this time you have certain figures like Giuseppe Mazzini, who is now, he's an Italian revolutionary based out of England, working with Lord Palmerston, and running these things. Um, it's, this manifests itself in America during post time in two, two, a two pronged attack. One of Mazzini's uh, colleagues, uh, who he's organizing and collaborating with in the south of America, is a fellow named Albert Pike. There's long letters of correspondence between Pike and Mazzini, where Pike is essentially the guy who goes on to found the KKK. He's a, a general who leads 
the, uh, the Southern Confederate cause to break up the Union and undo the American Revolution from the South. From the North, you have uh, Palmerston, you have John Stuart Mill, who are big controllers of British intelligence, along with people like Thomas Carlyle, who runs the, the Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh Review in London, uh, who's basically cultivating a new movement called the Transcendentalists. So how does this work? How, does, how do these young Americans uh, express themselves? Well, the, one of the key founders of it writes a book called Young America in 1844 named Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Emerson, uh, who's one of the, the leaders of the New England Transcendentalist movement that Poe is always at war with, writes in this book saying, at this moment, the terror of old people and the vicious people is that the union of these states be destroyed as if the Union had any real basis than the good pleasure of a majority of its citizens to be united. But the wise and the just man will always feel that he stands on his own feet, that he imparts strength to the state, not receives security from it. And if all went down, he and such as he would quite easily, easily combine in a new and better constitution. So he's basically saying, don't fight to defend the Union, even though you have a polarization and a, a, a burgeoning civil war that's, that's going to happen. Saying, don't worry about it. He's not for, he's, he says, I'm not for slavery. But, you know, if they're for slavery, that's their right to be for slavery. But let's just let, let the South have their own country. Let's break it up, undo the revolution, start something new. It'll just happen. It, and if, you're, if you don't agree with me, you, you're not wise and you're not just. You're, you're, you must be an old person and, or, and vicious if you believe otherwise. So he's trying to bring about a new morality. Now... When he, was in Fran uh, when he was in Britain, Emerson declared himself to be the lieutenant of uh, Thomas Carlyle. So he stayed at Carlyle's house. He stayed with, at Bentham's house. And he published uh, Sartre Resartus, who, which is a, a long document that Carlyle wrote to undermine the American Declaration of Independence, where in it, here's a section where Carlyle writes, and he looks very pouty and angry in this picture, uh, there is in man something higher than love of happiness, he can do without happiness, and instead thereof find blessedness. This is the everlasting yea, wherein all contradiction is resolved, wherein whoso walks and works, it is well with him. So basically be a peasant. <laughs> as, you don't need to be happy as long as you just exist. Just work, be, be your little self. That's, you'll, you'll be blessed that way. But don't try to change your circumstances. This is basically his thesis in the course of his writings. Just be. Um, and this is an important lesson, because how is it that the, 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 young, the young movements, young Europe, young America, how are they created, these, these mob uh, battering rams against all establishment, which is deemed corrupt? How is it organized? How do people lose their individuality and their conscience to become uh, part of a mob? which is more stupid than the sum of its parts. And it's really, ironically, that when you just focus on your looking out for yourself, standing on your own two feet, forgetting about the, the general welfare, forgetting about the whole that you're a part of, and just be becoming concerned with yourself. As soon as you focus on yourself and you stop caring about the whole, ironically, you lose yourself and you become susceptible to being manipulated by popular opinion. And that's really the secret that people like... Um, James Fenimore Cooper, Poe, all of these people were all targeting. And Fenimore Cooper makes the point very well in 1838 in his American Democrat uh, book, where he writes, whenever the government of the United States shall break up, it will probably be in consequence of a false direction having been given to popular opinion, public opinion. This is the weak point of our defenses and the part to which the enemies of the system will direct all their attacks. Opinion can be so perverted as to cause the false to seem true, the enemy a friend, and the friend an enemy. The best interests of the nation to appear insignificant, and trifles of moment. In a word, the right, the wrong, and the wrong, the right. In a country where opinion has sway, to seize upon it is to seize upon power. As it is a rule of humanity that the upright and the well-intentioned are comparatively passive, while the designing, dishonest, and selfish are the most untiring in their efforts, the danger of public opinions getting a false direction is fourfold, since few men think for themselves. And Fenmore Cooper's, uh, James Fenmore Cooper's uh, colleague, Edgar Poe, 
you'll find this theme coming up again and again in his, in his writings, fiction and nonfiction alike, but I found one of the most entertaining and, and interesting expressions of this attack on popular opinion is, is in a piece called Milona Tauta in 1849, which is actually an extract from a longer piece that he wrote called Eureka on his thoughts on the metaphysical and moral foundations of the universe dedicated to Alexander von Humboldt, which is very interesting and not found in a lot of the, the Poe anthologies that are available. But in this, he writes in the voice of a character a thousand years in the future and looking back on the, the mistakes and the absurdities of the past and what caused a great republic to fall into collapse uh, a thousand years earlier, he writes... The, out of the, again, this, this person, Pandita's mouth. While the philosophers, however, were busied in blushing at their stupidity and not having foreseen these inevitable evils and intent upon the invention of new theories, the matter was put to an abrupt issue by a fellow of the name Mob, who took everything into his own hands and set up a despotism, in comparison with which those of the fabulous zeros and hello fagabaluses were respectable and delectable. This mob, a foreigner by and by, is said to have been the most odious of all men that ever encumbered the earth. So what we're dealing with here is a pretty funny uh, way of describing the mob as a dictatorship, a tyranny of essentially the stupid. And they're stupid because they're, they're led to believe that the fabulous zeros, I don't know what the word hello fagabaluses is, but I don't think it's a very respectable term, um, <laughs> But they're led to believe that these uh, entities, these zeros, these nothings, are respectable and delectable uh, <laughs> sources of, of, of inspiration. Um, and this is what destroyed the Republic. Now, this Milana Tauta Eureka uh, book inspired Poe. I mean, Poe wrote this as part of what was going to be a manifesto, he gave a series of lectures which brings up the issues of, the deepest issues of epistemology, of science, um, which are relevant today. And he originally had this written as an intention to be an organizing manifesto for a new magazine called The Stylus. When he died in um, Baltimore, he had already acquired $1,500 of subscription money in Virginia, which he was on the way to New York to immediately use to set up for the first time uh, a magazine, called, which he called The Stylus. Originally, it was called The Pen. He changed the name, and it was going to be designed entirely to de declare an offensive epistemological warfare against those corrupting influences in America. Um, when he died, that money disappeared, and, and that potential was, was washed away. But, as we've come to discover, history is not something which is linear. And it's, because it's shaped by morality, truth, and ideas, there's something which the oligarchy can't always control and snuff out, which is embedded in the hearts of everybody on some, on some deeper level. And some people it's more conscious than others, but it's there. And by reawakening and revisiting Poe from this light, I think we're not only going to find a lot of value in terms of empowering ourselves to have better insight into the nature of man and the universe, but also to empower ourselves to change things and to reawaken those creative powers that Poe believed was in everybody's heart. Now, Christine uh, is going to give, is going to follow this up and give a, a, an actual concrete example, a couple, but of a piece by Poe which is often overlooked, um, which is mischaracterized, as famous as it is. Nobody, I don't think, really fully understands what this is. So, uh, Christine will, will give the next presentation, and then following that up, uh, David will be doing something uh, very special on rediscovering an idea that Poe had about poetry, which has been unfortunately forgotten. So, Christine, could I invite you up?